One of the biggest mistakes that open source projects make is that they make it way too difficult for developers to actually contribute code to their projects. So in this video, I'm gonna show you exactly how to fix that. Let's go. Alrighty, welcome. Now, in one of my other videos, I walked through my three models for how to build effective communities, okay? And the third of those models is called a collaborator. Uh, community, okay? So let me just do this. I want to provide a bit of context because this is really important to make sure we're solving the right problems. Now, this collaborator model, this is anyone who builds technology, whether it's uh, an application or a plugin or an extension or a rule set, something along those lines. And this model breaks into two different types. We've got inner and outer, all right? Now, again, this is really important to distinguish. Outer uh, collaborator communities, these are, are communities that focus on someone building something that sits on something else, okay? So an extension for a CRM, or it could be a plugin for WordPress, or it could be an app that runs on top of an app store, or it could be a module for a video game engine, or something along those lines, okay? Now the inner uh, model here, this is basically open source. These are, pe these are projects where people are working together on exactly the same code base. So you need people to be on the same level playing field, to have equal levels of opportunity to create amazing code that's gonna benefit that particular project. So that's what I wanna cover in this video today. If you're interested in how to make it easy for developers to create apps and extensions and plugins for your platform or your service, then you wanna check out my other video which focuses on the outer model, all right? Now, because we're talking about making it easy for developers to get started with an open source project, we are therefore talking about an on-ramp. And because we're talking about an on-ramp, we get a lovely big triangle, okay? I'd like you to all take a moment to witness the majesty of my triangle. Okay, it's a weird thing to say. If you like my triangle, go into the comments and say, Jono, I love your onboarding triangle. It looks fantastic. Now, this is the start of the process. So this is somebody who's brand new. They've never ever contributed to your project before. Okay, so we're gonna mark this person uh, here with a little, little face, okay? This is the starting point. And then the end goal that we wanna get with the onboarding experience is that they actually make some kind of contribution. So let's first of all talk about these, these two parts, okay? Now the end part of the process, this is usually gonna be a bug fix or um, a feature or something that, a piece of code that lands in that open source project that adds some kind of value. So it may be as small as fixing a typo or it could be as large as a large feature set, okay? So we wanna get them to this point. Now, when we think about the person who's going through this process, you want to evaluate who they are and what they're interested in and what kind of experience they've got. So to paint a picture, an example of this, let's assume that this person is called Sarah, okay? And Sarah is um, a user of a game engine, okay? Let's say that Sarah is a video game developer. She builds video games that run on top of a particular game engine, okay? And let's say Sarah is interested in fixing a bug that she's found in the game engine. She went and reported it to the GitHub project. It hasn't been fixed yet. She really needs it to be fixed for, uh, for, her, for a game, for a release. And therefore she wants to uh, create the fix and contribute it back to the project so everybody else can benefit from it, okay? This is a typical scenario, okay? So the first thing we need to evaluate is, well, what can we assume about Sarah, okay? The fact that she is a video game developer, she's probably gonna be mainly focused on her own game and not focused on your game engine, which is your open source project. So therefore she's not gonna have a huge amount of time necessarily for contributing to your project. She's just trying to do the right thing, all right? So we're gonna assume that Sarah doesn't know anything about your code base, doesn't know anything about the, the culture and the rules and the norms of how your project operates. And we wanna clarify all of these questions in the most efficient and simple way possible, okay? Does that make sense? Yeah, all right. Now there's basically six stages that you want someone to go through in any kind of onboarding for developers, okay? And I'm gonna mark these. I'm gonna do one, and I'm gonna go through each of these one by one so it can be as easy as possible for you lovely people to follow, all right? All right. Now, step number one of your onboarding is gonna be why, okay? Why on earth should they bother, you know? Let's look at it from Sarah's perspective. She's building this video game. She's busy enough with her own stuff. She's probably got a family outside of her work as well. She's got interests and hobbies. She's got her tax returns to go through and do. She's got a billion other things that are taking her away from contributing to your project. So why should she do it? Why should she take the time? And you know, just saying, well, it's the right thing to do, that just doesn't hold water with most people, okay? There's gotta be 
good justifiable reasons why someone's going to contribute to your open source project. It could be that they can solve their problems. She can get the software that she's depending on to work more efficiently or to work more reliably. It could be she can meet cool people and get to know great developers and she can grow her career and develop skills that will be useful or it could be useful to go on her resume, okay? So what you want to do as step one is make sure that you've got a document somewhere such as a web page or it could go into your contributing.md and your GitHub or your GitLab repo that explains the benefits of why. This should be a set of bullet points, super simple, super easy to read, that explain why this is gonna be worthwhile, why she's gonna take time and attention away from the rest of her life to do that. I mean, just think about it this way, just look at what we're drawing here, okay? There's a lot to go through in making that first contribution. So we need to make sure that she's excited about that workflow before she even starts going through it, and that's gonna kind of propel her through the process, all right? So that's step number one, super critical. So many open source projects miss that piece off, and a lot of people you know, only get so far through and then they give up because they've not justified it enough about the value for themselves, okay? So that's step number one. Now step number two, two is all about tools. You wanna make it as easy as possible for Sarah to get the necessary tools in place to create a contribution into that particular project, okay? Now, typically, the first area that's gonna be really important here is gonna be whatever's needed to build it, okay? So how do you actually build the software, all right? Now, this is gonna be making sure that you can easily go and access the build tools, the, the tool chain that you need for that particular project. Now, the key thing here is when you evaluate who your typical developer is gonna be, well, what are they running? Are they running on a Mac or Linux or Windows? Are they gonna be building for mobile phones for different hardware architectures? So depending on your project, you'll wanna evaluate how do I make sure that those tools are made as easily available as possible to my audience. So let's just say for the sake of argument that Sarah is running Ubuntu, so she's running Linux. Well, then making it easy for her to go and get the tools would be likely providing links to packages inside of Ubuntu. So you'd have, you know, commands that she can paste into a terminal to go and get the whole build chain in one go, okay? So you're gonna to wanna to evaluate that, but don't just assume that your audience is just gonna be focusing on one platform. Maybe there's gonna be other people who are contributing to the this game engine who are on a Mac, for example. So you're gonna to wanna to make sure that you've got packages that are available there as well. But make sure it's dead simple to just get that up and running. Now the key thing about this, about this build piece, which is absolutely critical, is that somebody should be able to build your software in less than 10 minutes, okay? Now this may seem like an arbitrary number, but it's not really, okay? There was a, I forget who told me this, uh, that years ago at Microsoft, there was this kind of general principle that um, a customer should be able to take the shrink wrap off a box, this is when software came in boxes, and do something useful with that software within 10 minutes, okay? And that was a good way of evaluating what a lot of people would call time to value, all right? You wanna do the same thing with your developer onboarding, is you want to be able to have somebody build this within 10 minutes so they're ready to write software, all right? Now, that will vary from project to project, but that's a good way to kind of get started and think about making it as easy as possible to get up and running. Now, outside of the build tools, you may also wanna consider supplemental tools, okay? Um, now, these are gonna be uh, tools and packages that may make just writing software for that particular game engine easy. It's gonna be things like linters and debuggers and other things like that. They may not be critically required for somebody con to contribute to the project, but it's good to highlight them as well, okay? So in terms of these things, you're gonna, again, wanna make sure that these are gonna be um, basically documentation. It's gonna go in your contributing.md, it's gonna go in other bits and pieces of documentation that you've got available to developers, all right? So that's step number, step number two. So again, just to recap why, explain why they should come and participate in this journey to get the tools that they need up and running as quickly as possible. Now, step number three is where we talk about skills, okay? What are the skills that Sarah needs to be able to contribute effectively to the project? And this can be broken into a few different types, okay? So the first thing is gonna be the code base, okay? You're gonna wanna make sure that you actually have some documentation that explains how your code base works, okay? What is the class hierarchy that you've got in there? What, what, kind of, um, what kind of key methods and accesses and functions and other bits and pieces you're, you've got baked into your code base that she's gonna need to know to, to figure out how that wiry mess of code actually fits together? Because of course, for Sarah, with her first contribution, she's never looked at the, this game engine's code base beforehand. She needs to, first of all, before she can even start building her fix, she needs to figure out how the code base works, okay? 
And that is a huge amount of detail, a huge amount of complexity that she's got to balance in her head so she knows how to get started, okay? So the easier you can make it for her to figure out all of that kind of stuff, the better, okay? Now this doesn't have to be reams and reams of documentation. If you want to make it easy, it could be just a YouTube video where you just kind of go through and walk broadly how everything kind of fits together and maybe you update that every so often as it changes. But make sure you've got something that's going to lower the lift for her to figure out how your code base glues together. You know, think of it as a, um, as, a, as a recipe for how your overall code base works, okay? So that's the first thing. The next thing that you're going to want to out outline here is how she goes about creating a fix, okay, or how to create a feature. So this could be a getting started guide, uh, it could be a step-by-step -step breakdown for how she creates a bug fix or how she creates a feature. All those kinds of considerations, not just in terms of how she writes the code, but how she builds it, any tests that need to be required as part of that, that, that fix or that feature or that, you know, whatever she's contributing to it. But explain the process of creation. So she understands how the code base works and then she understands how to actually create it. And then what you also want to make sure that you, you highlight here as well is going to be contribution, okay? So, contribution, if you can read my terrible writing. I've got terrible handwriting. I really have nothing more to say about that. So this is what does she need to do to actually contribute that back to the project, okay? So this is gonna be things like how your code review process works. You know, how do you go and take that fix that you've created in your branch and actually share it with the project? And what should be included with that? Do you need to include any additional information, any additional tests, any other uh, content that's relevant to that contribution. Essentially what we're trying to do with the skills phase is to make sure that any questions that she may have uh, are documented in a way that's simple and easy for her to understand, okay? This is not about quantity, it's about quality. It's better to have 500 words of carefully written material that answers the main questions than a massive manual full of content, okay? Nobody wants to read that kind of stuff. So explain how the code base works, explain any of the requirements and how to create that uh, contribution and then how she goes about contributing it back into the project, okay? So why tools and skills? Now the next one is gonna be the actual contribution. Okay? I find it very difficult to write on a whiteboard um, without resting my hand down. I don't know why I can't do this. That is an absolute mess, okay? Sorry, you deserve better than this, okay? Hang on, let me, oh, this is going well, isn't it? Okay, let's do <laughs> Contribution, this is actually looking worse. Okay, let's just, both of us agree that that says contribution, even though it actually doesn't look like it. Now this is where Sarah will actually create that contribution, will actually make the thing that's gonna go into the project, all right? Now there's not necessarily a huge amount that you're gonna be able to provide here in this phase. She's just going to have to go and create it, but she should at this point have enough available to her in terms of the rationale why she should do it, the tool chain setup, and then the, and then the documentation that she needs to get the skills that are necessary to contribute. So this is basically where she just does what she needs to do, okay? Um, one other thing that you will want to make sure that you've got easily available as part of this process, I forgot to mention this in the skills, is make sure that there's good API documentation. Make sure that if she's trying to use a particular method or a particular class that it's easy to understand, uh, you know, what that thing actually does. There are all too many uh, open source projects that don't have basic API documentation that can be an absolute nightmare for a developer trying to figure out how everything fits together. Now, step number five, this is where we get help, okay? Now, so just to recap at this point in the process, Sarah goes to, you know, create a contribution to this project. She gets the rationale and the justification why she should do it. She installs the tool chain. She learns the skills that she needs to contribute. She starts making the contribution, okay? As she's going through this process, she's gonna get stuck. There's gonna be things that she's not gonna be able to figure out from the, the stuff you've already provided. Where does she go for help, okay? Now, typically, this is gonna be one of a few different places. It could be, for example, um, a chat channel, okay? It could be uh, a mailing list. Um, it could be a forum. Um, it could be a person, okay? But you're gonna wanna make sure that there's some place that she can be pointed to to go and answer the questions that she's got, okay? Now that could be a link to a forum or a Slack channel or a chat channel or a Discord or whatever it might be, but make sure that there is a place in your documentation as part of your onboarding approach that provides a place for where she can go. But that's only step one. Step two of 
pointing someone towards that resource is to make sure that there's actually someone there. The worst possible thing is when you're trying to contribute something into an open source project, you feel like you're doing the right thing, you're taking your time to go through this process, and then you go and ask a question and there's just, it's crickets? Well, that's not good for anybody, all right? So make sure that there's a place that people can go to. Um, and that could be, like I said, it could be as simple as a mailing list or a chat channel. It could be uh, just an email address that you can point uh, that person to as well, all right? So make sure that you've got that piece there. And then the final step of the process, and this is really important, is reward. Uh, now, this might seem a bit counterintuitive, but you're like, okay, well, Sarah's kind of been through this process, um, you know, justified why to do it, installed the tools, developed the skills, made the contribution, or written the code, uh, been able to, you know, answer her questions with what she needed to do. Why would you reward Sarah for doing so? There's going to be loads of different developers going through this process. Why do we need to highlight one particular individual? Well, you want this for absolutely everybody. The first time anyone does anything in life, it's a watershed moment, okay? The first time Sarah gets her fix into the project and it successfully gets um, accepted and merged into the main branch, this is a big deal. It's not just a big deal for Sarah, it's a big deal for you and your project as well. This is another positive relationship that's forming that's gonna make your project better and help Sarah to feel part of something that's gonna be really rewarding to her as well. This is an important step in the process that all too many open source projects leave off, okay? So think of what you can offer Sarah for when she gets her first pull request merged in, okay? It could be a piece of swag, you know, you could send her a mug, or it could be a sticker, it could be a challenge coin, it could be something as simple as a thank you email, or it could be highlighting her in a tweet, or something along those lines. But there needs to be something, an intangible or a tangible reward, something that basically says to Sarah, we really appreciate what you did. It may have been a one-line fix, doesn't matter. We really appreciate that you contributed to our project, that's awesome. All right, so make sure you have something in place to do so. I have another video which you can go and check out, which is about how to do swag well, which provides a whole bunch of ideas. Now, what's critical is you may be thinking, okay, well, John, this sounds fine, okay? And let me just recap again. So the why is why should someone spend the time to go through this process and contribute to your project? The, the second one is tools. Make sure that they can get the tools up and running as quickly and easy as possible. Next is skills, how to learn the skills that you need to participate. The fourth part is actually making the contribution and writing the code. The fifth is a place to go and get help, such as a mailing list, a forum, a chat channel, whatever else. And the sixth is where they can go and get rewarded for that first contribution, all right? So that's the, that's the method. This piece, number one, and this piece, number six, apply to every single onboarding experience you can think of, okay? Whether you're asking people to do documentation, to write tests, to run events, to create content, to create applications for your platform, anything else, why they should participate and do this and rewarding them for making that first contribution are absolutely essential in everything that you do, okay? So I'd strongly recommend you put this in place. Most, most of this will live in a contributing.md file um, with some exceptions, like you wanna make sure your help resource is gonna be, you know, like I say, a channel or a forum or something along those lines, but make sure you're intentional about putting these pieces in place. There's one final thing I do wanna highlight, which I think is really important, is that the very best onboarding journeys, okay, each step leads to the next, okay? So when somebody has um, read the, the copy that you've written about why all the benefits to contributing to your open source project, it should naturally lead to the next step, which is going to be uh, installing the tool chain, okay? And then once they've installed the tool chain, the next logical step is that then can read some documentation for how to get started and understanding the code base and making a contribution. The next step after that is gonna be actually going and writing the code, okay? And as part of that process, they're probably then gonna go and get help with your help resource. And then once they've made that contribution, then we're gonna reward them, okay? So that's it. Hope you found that useful. Be sure to go and hit that like button because I like likes, you should like likes, and YouTube really likes likes. Likes, 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 likes. Um, but also go and hit that subscribe button and of course that notification bell, and I'll see you some other time. See ya.